Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Very glad you're with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for you as usual. Jim, uh, I think we posted the podcast around one yesterday, and by the time most people even saw the tweet about it, uh, school in the local area was canceled for today, and I... I'm not optimistic about uh, public schools being open again tomorrow, but we are going to talk about the weather in Virginia in our crazy martini and uh, folks who aren't quite sure who uh, runs this state at the moment. But let's start with our good martini because the good martini uh, has a lot to do with an underappreciated story, I think, from the 2020 election. And that's how well Republicans did at the state level. A lot of controversy, obviously, at the presidential level and the tight fight for the Senate and even the fight for the House ended up being tight. But Republicans uh, weathered a huge barrage from Democrats at the state legislature level, kept uh, all the majorities they had and even added one in New Hampshire. And as a result, they get to do redistricting in those states. Democrats have tried to be aggressive in the states where they're in control, like Maryland, like Illinois, like California. But as of right now, with 33 of the 50 states having completed congressional redistricting, Larry Sabato's crystal ball over at the Center for Politics at UVA, and if you've paid a lot of attention to Larry in the past couple of years, you know he's not tilting anything in favor of the Republicans if he doesn't think that that they uh, have warranted this. But he says, in the states where this is done, Democrats currently control 149 seats while Republicans control 133. Based on our new ratings, 135 seats in these states are rated safe, likely, or leans Republican. And that same number, 135, are rated safe, likely, or leans Democratic. There are 13 toss-ups. One way of looking at this is based on our ratings, Republicans are up two seats while Democrats are down 14. Meaning that in these states, Democrats would have to essentially win all of the toss-ups just to maintain a rough parity with what they held before. And uh, one of the folks who works over there, I think it's Kyle Kondek, posted, you know, how well uh, the toss up uh, races have gone for the party out of power in recent midterm elections. And let's just say they're pretty lopsided, which means those would most likely tilt towards Republicans unless there's a dramatic change in uh, the political landscape in this country. So, Jim, most of the major Democratic states are already done with this. Uh, uh, There are more Republican states. And uh, so at this point, it looks like the House map is looking very, very good for Republicans, hopefully headed towards a majority. Greg, I thought this assessment, by the way, if you if Larry Sabato is driving you crazy on Twitter these days, that's fine. I I suspect it's because people keep mistaking him for Mike Lindell. Uh, and it drives him crazy. But uh, if he if he's, you know, whatever you think of him, the guys at the Center for Politics actually are pretty reliable and even handed in their assessment of stuff like this. If they say a district is leaning safe Democrat, likely Democrat, stuff like that, they're generally on the ball with this. I don't see anything to really question about their numbers. Um, but the other thing which I think is really intriguing here is that this company actually was just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal editorial board, I'm sorry, it was two days ago, said the end of the ger- GOP gerrymander panic. You may remember hearing all of these, you know, political scientists saying Republican gerrymandering is going to put the House of Representatives in Republican hands for a decade. And, you know, gerrymandering is the worst thing ever. And the editorial board looked at the results. You look at what happened out of California. Look what happened out of New Jersey, New York. Um, You do end up with uh, uh, pretty decent gains for Democrats. And then you look at places like Colorado and Arizona, you end up with more swing states uh, or more swing districts, Illinois, Maryland, Oregon. Uh, they're all pushing aggressive Democratic gerrymanders. Republicans are doing similar in Ohio and North Carolina. So the one thing that comes out of this is that you're not seeing um, what, what, you, what you described there of, well, actually, you know, there's a little bit of a Republican advantage and there are a whole bunch of swing districts or uh, purple districts that in a good Republican year, they're going to probably going to win. But there's going to be a whole bunch of competitive races. I think that's good for America. I think that's good for this. And I think it probably what is panicking Democrats is that they've looked at the numbers. They've looked at the shifts in the country. They've realized there just aren't enough Democrats anymore. <laughs> you just can't draw enough safe districts the way you want. And of course, every incumbent Democrat wants to be protected, uh, which inevitably when you have this you know, narrow House majority, you draw those lines. Inevitably, somebody ends up with a district that is less safe than it was before. Not impossible. Incumbency has all kinds of advantages. Stranger things have happened. But I think you look at this, one, you've got a whole bunch of competitive races in a circumstance that based on the political circumstances right now and the outlook 
uh, up until November 2022 and historical trends and how they usually go bad for the president's party. You look at all Republicans should be racking up a whole bunch of House wins and probably are going to win back control of the House of Representatives. But Democrats really can't argue that this is being done on the back of aggressive uh, um, uh, redistricting and gerrymandering. And in fact, you look at what's happening in New York and New Jersey and California. Democrats did plenty of aggressive gerrymandering themselves to protect their incumbent members. Um, and of course, both parties are like giant steaming hypocrites on this. But all in all, I kind of look at this and say, yeah, hey, you know, what? this is probably where we should end up with. Uh, and I feel pretty good about Republicans winning back the House and they're going to win it back fair and square, not by being. I'm going to radically alter a quote from Winston Churchill here, Jim. You know, he once said that democracy was the worst form of government except for all the others. I think gerrymandering is the worst form of uh, uh, figuring out congressional districts except for everything else. Uh, obviously, whoever has the majority in these state legislatures is uh, going to have uh, a, a partisan tack to them. But these people were elected by the people. I know some states have tried to go with these independent commissions. And Jim, I don't know if you've noticed that this country is a little bit polarized right now. Finding a truly independent commission, I think, is proving to be very difficult. You're seeing a lot of people frustrated uh, in terms of redistricting at the congressional level, the state level. And so while uh, state legislatures doing it might not be the most fair way to do it and the way you draw the most competitive districts, uh, I, I still think I prefer that where the people have that say, as opposed to voting once on a constitutional amendment to the state. And then, uh, you know, uh, then these independent commissions come in that necessarily aren't very independent. Indeed, Greg. And by the way, if, you know, gerrymandering was the be all and end all that some people make it sound like, you'd never see an incumbent lose. But you do see incumbent lose. It does happen all that often, right? Generally, they have to, you know, screw up in some way, get caught in a scandal or, uh, you know, they're in a representing something of a purple district and a wave is running against them or something like that. But the other fact, which also is, almost never comes up in these sorts of things, is that how, you know, we, we hold the census once a decade. Next year or two, the state legislatures and everybody hashes out how to draw the district lines. And then everybody has them. You have that first midterm. You have that first presidential race. And then people move. <laughs> and a district that looks really safe at the start of a decade might not look all that safe by the end of the decade. Populations move around. We've actually seen during the pandemic an enormous amount of people moving. A lot of people moving from blue states to red states. So the idea that, oh, you know, because of gerrymandering, they're going to have that, eh, not necessarily. And we've seen political winds shift pretty quickly. So not all that much time passed between 2006 midterms and 2010 midterms. And you went from a huge Democratic gain to a huge Demo Republican gain. So all in all, I think there are people who like, like to overstate the effect of gerrymandering. I think it's often a wash. I don't think either party has clean hands on this sort of thing. It's a longstanding um, you know, tradition going back to uh, basically revolutionary times, practically. And uh, you know, all in all, I think this is turning out as both good for the Republicans and probably good for the country that there's going to be so many competitive districts in the year to come. Yeah, Virginia just went through this, too, with its independent commission. I honestly am not quite sure which district I'm in at this point. I used to be in the first district, which had, uh, you know, just this little part of the People's Republic of uh, Northern Virginia, which is deep, deep blue where I live. Uh, and then it snaked into a much redder part of the Commonwealth. And so I had a Republican congressman. Now I think... I'm in Abigail Spanberger's district. But the fun part is, you know, you get fundraising uh, messages in your email box from all these people before the redistricting was done saying, I am dedicated to this district. And then the lines get drawn. So they live in a different district. And they're like, and now I'm dedicated to running and winning in this <laughs> district. You're on your own, suckers. <laughs> Don't ask me for anything now that you're on that side of the line. That's right. Oh, well, I'll tell you where you don't want to be a sucker, and politics is one area, but also when it comes to your online privacy and protection. Look, it just doesn't make sense that the same company that controls half of online retail also passively eavesdrops on your private conversations at home. And what about the idea that a single company controls 90% of internet searches, runs your email service, I bet you can't guess which one we're talking about, and gets to track everything you do on your smartphone? Big tech is more powerful than most countries are, and they profit by exploiting your personal data. But you do have a way to protect yourself. It's time to put a layer of protection between your online activity and these tech juggernauts. And that's why you need ExpressVPN. Think about how much of your life is on the internet. And sadly, every site that you visit, every video that you watch, and every message you send gets tracked and data mined. But when you run ExpressVPN on your device, the software hides your IP address, something big tech can use to personally identify you. 
So ExpressVPN makes your activity harder to trace and to sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data to keep you safe from hackers and eavesdroppers on your network. And ExpressVPN does all of this without slowing down your connection. That's why it's rated the number one VPN service by Mashable and TechRadar. And what you're probably gonna like the most about ExpressVPN is how easy it is to use. You just download the app onto your phone or your computer, tap one button, and you will be protected. It's easy, it works, and you're gonna get a great deal if you sign up now. Stop handing over your personal data to the big tech monopoly that mines your activity and sells your information. Protect yourself with the VPN that we trust to keep us safe online. Visit expressvpn.com slash martini. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash martini to get three extra months for free. Go to expressvpn.com slash martini right now to learn more. All right, Jim, let's move to our bad martini now, and it's a new year, and apparently it's going to be a year of few legal headaches for former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. Apparently, now that he's paid his political price and he's no longer governor, uh, we're just going to pretend all these scandals uh, don't actually amount to legal challenges. Just in the past couple of days, uh, he's gotten some very good news. First of all, this is from Politico. Prosecutors in Manhattan have concluded Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo did not break the law when his administration misled the public about the number of COVID-19 deaths tied to nursing homes, the Democrats' former attorney said on Monday. Elkin Abramowitz, who served as outside counsel to Cuomo's office, said in a statement that the former governor was told Monday by the head of the Manhattan District Attorney's Elder Abuse Unit that the office had completed a thorough investigation and would not bring charges. As we have said all along, there was no evidence to suggest that any laws were broken, Abramowitz said in a statement. Meanwhile, up in Albany, the uh, Albany County District Attorney's Office said Tuesday it was dropping criminal charges of forcible touching against former Governor Cuomo just days before he was set to uh, be arraigned. Uh, Hat tip to Brittany Bernstein, your uh, colleague at National Review, for that story. So, Jim, I can't escape the feeling that these are Democrats who feel like the Democratic damage control has has done as much as it can do. And so why why go down this road? Or maybe there just isn't enough in some of these cases uh, to prosecute. But it's certainly frustrating, and especially for those families, the thousands of families who lost loved ones in those nursing homes. Yeah, it, it's uh, infuriating because it could be it's theoretically possible. This is all for legitimate reasons. Um, back when I was doing the. Uh, a long profile on, on the federal prosecutor, John Durham, uh, who's doing the, the investigation into the Russiagate stuff. He's only given one big speech in his life at his alma mater, but he made this point about the duties of a prosecutor. One of the things he says is not just, do you think you can bring a case? Anybody can bring a case. The old saying, you know, you can indict a ham sandwich. The question is, you know, can you, do you think you can convince a jury, which is obviously a pretty darn important consideration. And then the next question is, do you think that conviction could be sustained on appeal? Now, look, I'm not a lawyer. I don't pretend to be. I don't know all the different factors that go into this. But if you've got any doubts, if you have this nagging sense that eh, maybe if I get the right jury, maybe they'll buy it. Eh, I don't know. You know like if, if you have doubts, then because of the awesome power of a prosecutor, and they, knowing that someone has been indicted on charges and the reputational damage that does to someone, that you really ought to only bring it when you know you've got the right guy, when you know you can convince a jury, 12, a jury of 12 people, yes, this person committed this crime. It's very refreshing when you feel like you've seen you know, uh, prosecutions that have occurred for political reasons or in response to public pressure or because a prosecutor wants to run for office or something like that. It's a really refreshing, like, look, it's not just do you think the person did it, it's do you think you can prove it and do you think that conviction can stick? Now, I don't know, maybe that's what was at work here. Maybe the prosecutors looked at the evidence available against Cuomo on both the nursing home issue and the sexual harassment issue and said, you know what? I don't know if we can get 12 people to believe this. Or, uh, you know, he's he's gonna be a really tough defendant. He's gonna be able to talk about all these things he did during the pandemic, or he's gonna be able to say, what was his excuse? I'm not perverted, I'm just Italian or something. You know, (laughs) I just like touching people, you know? And okay, look, I I look at that, we all look at this, oh my God, this guilty is sin. Like some of the stuff is on camera, right? You look at that and say, okay, well, there's an example of a guy who does a lot of unwanted touching and things like that. But uh, look, maybe the prosecutors genuinely believe this. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. This happens in a context of everybody in New York State being afraid of, the, the, of uh, Andrew Cuomo, everybody in New York State knowing that he was a bully, that he was a maniac, that he would threaten people, 
And everybody in New York State, almost, almost everybody in New York State who has a D after their name, averted their eyes and pretended it wasn't that bad and pretended they didn't notice because it was politically expedient. And in that context, it's really tough to just take it on the word of these prosecutors of, yeah, there just isn't enough evidence, we wouldn't be able to make the charges stick. Maybe it's the case, maybe it isn't. I hope the reputational damage of Andrew Cuomo sticks. I hope he never returns to public office. I hope he goes off and finds something else to do with the rest of his life and he keeps his hands to himself. Um, but I have no guarantees of that and a prosecution and a conviction would have been a lot easier uh, to ensure that uh, any you know maniacal narcissistic dreams of a political comeback, we could drive a stake into the heart of them and ensure he would never plague New York State again. No pun intended, but I guess it fits. <laughs> Well, I can't imagine that these decisions are going to do much for his humility, but uh, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, I hope he doesn't issue a statement on video today, although I get to dust off my impression again tomorrow if he does. So we'll find out. <laughs> uh, anyway. The silver lining to there's a star always, cloud. There's always a silver lining. All right. Let's talk about, uh, you know, uh, Cuomo's unemployed right now. I don't know if he's uh, looking for work. Maybe CNN will hire him. They seem to uh, like those sorts of people. But the MyPillow uh, brand has lots of uh, products that Andrew Cuomo could use to, to rest up at a quality level. Uh, the pillows, the sheets, the towels. The slippers. Uh, and look, you don't have to worry about the supply chain issues either because everything at MyPillow is in stock. No back orders, no delayed shipping for any of their products. The MyPillow is made 100% right here in the United States and they've built up a huge inventory so they can ensure their customers get what they need when they need it. MyPillow is in full stock of all items on their website. This includes everything from the MyPillows at their lowest price ever to the sheets, to the slippers, to the robes, and now cardigans. They're all in stock. They're all ready to ship fast. MyPillow is your one-stop shop where you can shop with confidence. And all MyPillow products come with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. Got to say, during the snowstorm, having those MyPillow slippers, actually known as my slippers, on my feet, very, very warm, very comfortable. Uh, and of course, uh, having uh, the sheets and the towels, fantastic as well. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio listener specials for specials like buy one, get one on Giza Dream Sheets or the lowest price ever on the MyPillow premiums when you use the promo code MARTINI or call 800-874-0104. Don't miss the sale of the year. That's MyPillow.com, promo code MARTINI or call 800-874-0104. Sleep better with MyPillow.com. On second thought, Jim, I don't think Andrew Cuomo is going to get a job at CNN. They seem to be a little bit tired of the Cuomos at this point. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> they've had their fill of Cuomos. Yeah. Yes, yes, they I have. Mean, some might argue, wasn't Andrew Cuomo working for CNN? You know, actually, no, it's more like CNN was working for Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> <laughs> at least in prime time. Yeah, really all day long, though. Uh, all right. Well, let's talk about what's going on here in Virginia. Uh, you know, we always make fun of how the... The media in New York and other the other big media centers uh, freak out over the weather because it's near them. So we're going to talk about the weather because it's near us. But it's also a big story. Uh, most areas around here seem to have gotten about a foot, which, uh, depending on where you live, might not seem like a lot or uh, might seem like a, a whole lot. But uh, uh, it's considered quite a bit around here. We usually get uh, a big snowstorm every few years. But the big problem around here, in addition to those still without power, thankfully uh, we're not in that situation, is the about a 50-mile stretch on I-95 from just south of where I am. Uh, down closer to uh, Fredericksburg and Richmond. And going on 24 hours now, Jim, as we uh, record this, they've literally been stuck, not moving at all, trees down, icy situations, accidents, the whole works. Uh, Senator Tim Kaine, in fact, has been part of that. He tweeted out this morning that he's you know, been stuck at that point for about 19 or 20 hours. Uh, there was a guy from CBS Miami, Jim DeFeedy, talking about how he hadn't seen even a state trooper in 12 hours. And he just got uh, word on his phone for everybody to hang tight and help us on the way. And he didn't exactly see that as totally reassuring. As of this morning, uh, Governor Ralph Northam had decided that he didn't need to call out the National Guard for this situation. <laughs> A lot of people are uh, second guessing that situation. Uh, so that's crazy, uh, although he may have changed that by the time you hear this. And secondly, uh, the craziest part of this, Jim, is people on Twitter and beyond absolutely livid at Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin for the horrific response to the crisis on I-95. The slight problem with that criticism being Glenn Youngkin's not governor until late next week. So uh, what do you make of, what do you make of the uh, reaction here? 
Uh, first of all, you and I usually enjoy making fun of Tim Kaine. I'm not going to make fun of Tim Kaine. Uh, the, you know, being stuck in your car for 19 hours sounds absolutely horrible. I got stuck in, like, and you, you probably have heard, you know, yes, whenever it snows in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, people, news, people in the news who work in Washington area will freak out or they'll talk about how bad it is and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, this was a genuine snow thing. And the real problem is that it came, started coming down right around the time of the morning rush hour. Uh, and that's when it really started to accumulate. You know, they'd said this was going to be a bad snow. So like most people, I assume, stayed home if they could. But obviously, a lot of people still have to go and do the work. And it does not appear that the road treatments were terribly effective. It does not appear they had a lot of plows on the big roads. And that's why you've got this absolute catastrophe on Interstate 95. And as people observe it, for a 50-mile stretch of nonstop traffic. So Tim Kaine, I got stuck in Carmageddon a couple of years ago. That was when I think it was like six hours, seven hours for me to get out of D.C. just to get to Alexandria. Sorry to hear it. I hope you get relief. Uh, on social media, you're starting to hear people saying, look, I, uh, I need my diabetes medication. I'm, I'm not, you know, people don't plan to spend 19 to 20, 21 hours in their cars uh, when they're heading out and stuff like that. They are, in, you know, this could be a genuine public health disaster with people who are stuck in their cars and need various uh, uh, treatments and, and things like that. So nothing of temperature issues overnight and all the other issues, people running out of gas and situations like that, disabled trucks. Um, it's really, really bad. It would be really nice if the current governor, the person who's still the governor, Ralph Northam, could get on this. I do this. He is still, you don't get to check out early. You are still on the job. Uh, and I would point out that, yes, Glenn Youngkin doesn't take office for another 11 days or so. I think it's the 15th yes. uh, of the inauguration. If I were him, though, I'd be getting out there with, you know, go to, go to Dunkin' Donuts, get like as many cups of coffee as you can, get as many donuts or any stuff as you get. Go out, get close to get as close to I-95 as you can, park, you know, off uh, one of the exits or something and head down and start handing them out and start doing what you can. Look responsive because the current governor has decided apparently to check out earlier. Um, by the way, apparently the National Guard could be mobilized. And at least as of before we started recording this, Greg, they haven't bothered to mobilize that. But hey, why would we want the institution with a whole bunch of trucks that can handle snow <laughs> to get out on in Interstate 95 at a time like this? Uh, apparently we don't need that. Apparently, uh, and I, I wanted to resist this, but I can't. Apparently, Ralph Northam just wants people to stay comfortable while they make a decision about how to get to him. Ooh, yeah, you know. Hey, you know what? Stay warm out there. Wear your hoods. Also, this might not be the greatest advertisement for electric cars. I mean, it's bad enough if you have a tank of gas, but uh, what happens if you st you run out of battery power there? For all the complaints about SUVs, oh, they're gas guzzlers. Oh, they're heavier. Oh, they don't fit into parking garages. Ugh. Boy, when it snows, you sure do like having SUVs, don't you? Um, you know, so, you know I, I remember during Carmageddon, uh, which was, I don't know, it was like 20, 2010, 20, I'm gonna say sometime during the Obama years, uh, I was in D.C. Somebody wanted to do an interview and uh, snow started coming down. I think they let out the federal government's workers out at the same time. And of course, everybody was on the roads at the same time. It wasn't terribly heavy snow, but it was, you know, enough to make things icy and, and you know, just, you know, bumper to bumper traffic. I remember the, the radio traffic guy saying, I've never seen it like this before. Every route in and out of the city is absolutely block solid. It's nonstop red tail lights. Nobody's going anywhere. People, you know, just do the best you can. And the sheer frustration of just, you know, knowing that there's just not too many options. I think at one point I was able to pull off and think in Sherlington and at least have something to eat and let it space out a little bit. Um, this area doesn't handle snow particularly well. It doesn't seem to communicate what needs to be done at times like this particularly well. You and I complain about the schools and, you know, the, at some point I joke, it seems like the D.C. area seems to take a perverse pride in its inability to handle snow. <laughs> but at this point you're starting to raise, there are real genuine yeah. life and death consequences of this sort of thing and you know a good thing for young young kid to start on would be to make sure you know say hey look we're state government we don't take anything lightly we will always be ready to respond whenever there's an adverse weather event yeah you've got hundreds of people you assume there who don't have water don't have food uh could be running out of fuel uh which means no heat uh and the temperatures are not good certainly weren't overnight and uh, one of the big problems in virginia also is we're constantly on the uh the melt freeze line which is why the weather forecast sometimes out, turns out to be a total dud and other times it turns out to be like it was yesterday but it also means you get refreezes and things like that which uh, uh you don't get necessarily in other climates so anyway uh we certainly hope regardless of uh partisan affiliation that uh, things get moving it looks like they're starting to around the the edges of this 50 mile swath of the interstate they shut down but it's going to take a while and if you're stuck in the middle 
man, our, our, our thoughts and prayers are definitely with you because it's going to still be a while yet. But uh, anyway, hope for uh, much better news on that front by tomorrow. Jim, I will talk to you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Please tell your friends about us as well. We are also uh, grateful for your kind reviews and your five-star ratings. Uh, get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play 3 Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday, and please join us on Wednesday for the next 3 Martini Lunch. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit DanaRadio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.